In many of my most recent videos in my History of Religion series, race has become a certain topic of discussion. Race is one of those topics that can easily be walked away from and most people do not want to speak on it. And if they do speak on it, it's very self-serving and a way to either promote themselves or to denounce others. Race is always a big elephant in the room. Now, it would be easy to leave this topic alone and not ruffle any feathers, but that is not what I feel led to do. So we need to discuss race. Now let's get a few things out there before we even begin. This is in no way seeking to place one group of people over another group of people. This is not about one group or race of people being better than another. Now I do realize that the truth can often lead to different types of feelings, but this is not the purpose of this video. The goal of this video is for education. When we are educated on subjects, we allow ignorance to slowly go away. We are the most formally educated generation in the history of the world, but the vast majority of the world does not know much about races besides skin color or nationality. In our most modern history, over the past three or four centuries, the world has been divided by race and dominion of nations. So this is what we know today, and that's how the majority sees it. I'm an American by nationality of the country I was born and live in. But to many that see me, I am a black man from Africa. A white man is looked at as a Caucasian from Europe. A Chinese man is an Asian. So besides the color of our skin, people seek to identify us by continents and regions. But is that fair? Is that accurate? The simple answer is no, it is not. So we need to discuss why. Let's begin. Now before we go into history, let's talk about race. Because believe it or not, race is a fairly modern idea. Over the history of our world, people did not classify people by their race or skin color. People were classified by their tribal names, such as Persians, Greeks, Jews, Saxons, Ethiopians, Egyptians, etc. The world was not divided by the term Negro or Caucasian. The world being divided by color was an idea that originated from white supremacists in Europe after the Renaissance period. Johann F. Blumenbach, a German anthropologist born in 1752, died in the year 1840, was the first to divide humanity on the basis of skin color. We can attribute much of our racial divide today because of him. Thanks, Johann. Now, don't misunderstand me. Racism already existed before this time. There was already a belief in scientific racism, which I will touch on shortly. Blumenbach did not create racism. He simply placed a classification system that is still used today. An official classification of people did not exist before Blumenbach. His work is considered one of the most influential works in regard to race. He classified that there were five chief races of mankind. They were the Caucasian or white race. He was the first to use this classification for people of European origin. He believed the people of the Caucasus Mountains were the most beautiful people in the world. This is where the term Caucasian comes from. Next he had the classification of Mongolians or the yellow race, which included all of East Asia and some of Central Asia. Then we have the Malayan or brown race, which included Southeast Asia and Pacific Islanders. Then the American, which was the red race. This was the American Indians. And lastly, the Ethiopians or the black race was the Sub-Saharan Africans. He was a white supremacist and considered the Caucasian to be the original race. So when we start talking about racial divide, this is where the conversation starts from. He basically color-coded the people of the world. He was a racist. If you're calling people white people or black people, it's because of his classification system. Then we have a 19th century French aristocrat named Joseph Arthur de Gobineau. Forgive my pronunciations. Now, he was known for his influence on legitimizing racism through the scientific racist theory and developing the theory of an Aryan master race. He wrote a 1400 page book named An Essay on the Inequality of the Human Races, which argues that there are differences between human races, that civilizations decline and fall when the races are mixed and that the white race is superior. He used the scientific racism theory. The scientific 
racism theory believes that there is evidence that exists to support and justify racism. Simply, their racial discrimination is justified through evidence that there is racial inferiority and then there's racial superiority. Scientific racism was common from the 1600s to the end of World War II, after the fall of the Nazis. It was publicly denounced as racist, but obviously held as a belief in many other influencers still to this day. Anyways, it was this J.A. Gubineau that really helped legitimize racism as being valid. Now, there were many others, like Houston Stewart Chamberlain, 1855 to 1927, who wanted to advance the supremacy of the white Nordic race and its culture. The point is that due to the influence of men like these and many others, it's where we get the division of race today. They added a psychological value to race that made people believe it was so. Basically, being that at that time, European civilizations were dominating much of the world through inhabiting foreign lands and possessing major breakthroughs in technology, they thought that they were obviously superior and others were inferior. This was racism, and it led to a lot of horrible racial philosophy, as well as the justification of slavery by the white Christian Americans who believed that they believed in Jesus, but their slavery and bondage of other people was justified because they were racially superior. It's ridiculous. But the theory was eventually denounced by the world after what the Nazis did in World War II. So any view of racism black people, white people, racial division. All of it is a very modern idea. It is not how the world viewed and classified people. Now, I know that doesn't change anything, obviously. Knowing this would not change racism today, but it should change many people's understandings of where these thoughts come from. If you believe your race is superior, it's because of the theories of white supremacists starting from the 17th century. People that look at the world as the white race are the ones that are able to get it together and hold jobs and be civilized is an idea of white supremacy. This is not a natural view that has been held since the beginning of time. Or the reverse can be said, that if you believe the black man is superior because he is physically more endowed, this is a twisting of white supremacy. You only see skin color because a white supremacist classified people in this way, and the world eventually adopted this thinking. And then formal education and mind-controlling programs kept the classifications going. You see, the powers that be want us to think in this way and it's all for purpose of division. This is racism and that's the condensed history of it. Racism is an idea that has been taught to people in modern history. It is not an idea that has been held in existence since the beginning of time. So the next question is, how did the world classify people before then? And where did these races that were classified come from? Now, that is a more in-depth question that can only be answered through an analysis of history. Like I said, before the racist theory, people were identified by their tribal name, the people that they came from. The Moors, Arabs, Babylonians, Philistines, etc. And these tribes are what spread out amongst the earth since the beginning of civilization and certain tribes were more dominant than others and created world empires of their known world during their time. So to have a better understanding of people, we need to go back to world history. Now my studies start back in the world's best known history book, the Bible. If you believe that men evolved from monkeys, then you will disagree with the beginning of my explanations until we come to the civilizations that are indisputable. My only question to those that believe this to be true is why aren't monkeys changing to humans today? Anyways, we go to the Bible. Now I know for many that don't believe in the Bible, you are immediately taken back and may want to stop watching because depending on who you are, you have different reasons for your lack of belief in the Bible. This video is not discussion about your belief in God, so you can take a step back from that. But if you do want to discuss him, I have a series called History of Religion. Start at part one and maybe it can answer some questions for you. But like I was saying, the Bible is a history book, primarily the Old Testament. It is a history book of the Israelites. The Israelites were an ancient tribe of the world, just like the Egyptians and Babylonians. But in their history book, they provide good background and a good starting point for anyone that wants to understand the history of civilizations. The Bible is not my only source though. 
I suggest a book by Rudolf Windsor called From Babylon to Timbuktu. His book is an excellent primer on history of civilizations. And as any researcher does, he cites many sources that you should read as well that will help you in your overall understanding. So when I discuss history, I like to start post-flood with Noah. This is where I start my History of Religion series as well, because much of the world before that time is not recorded. Now don't just run because I said Noah. Give me a minute or two, please. Just follow me. Noah had three sons. They were Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And from these three sons, the world was repopulated. So if we were really to classify people today, it would be proper to classify people according to this. There are Semites, Hamites, and Japhites. But your enemy does not want the Bible validated, so he will not teach you in this way. Again, not according to color of skin, but according to tribe. Now, the book of Genesis really provides a good basis of understanding of who these people are. When we read Genesis, and it talks about the different sons of men, he begot him, then he begot him. When reading that, we can often just skim over that as useless info. But if we decide to dig deep to gain more understanding, we can really grow. That info explains tribes of people, and if you follow the history of those tribes, you can follow the history of the world. This is why I speak of the Bible as the most known history book. You can debate about Noah and say it didn't happen. I absolutely believe it did. But when you keep reading after Noah, when it starts talking about the different tribal names, you cannot debate that these people and tribes existed. And this is what I will be speaking on. Let's start with the Hamites, the descendants of Ham. I start with them because in the beginning of recorded ancient history, they were the tribes of the great civilization. Let's track it. Now forgive any of my pronunciations. In Genesis chapter 10, it says, The sons of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush were Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Rama, Sabtaka, and Nimrod. All of these sons were Cushites. They dwelt in this land of northeastern Africa in the Nile Valley south of Egypt. They spread along the tracks extending from the higher Nile to the Euphrates and Tigris rivers. Of Cush's notable sons, we know of Nimrod, the father god of paganism. Chapter 10 says the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. If you look for the definition of Shinar, you will see this as another name for Sumer or Samaria, later known as Babylon after the Tower of Babel. After Cush, the other son of Ham was Mizraim. Mizraim is the Hebrew or Aramaic word for Egypt. The word Mizraim is plural form, meaning Upper and Lower Egypt. They were the second world empire after Samaria slash Babylon. Verse 13 of chapter 10 says, Mizraim begot, and forgive my pronunciation, Ludim, Anamim, Labahim, Naphtuhim, Pathruzim, and Kalsuhim, from whom came the Philistines and Kaphtorim. So you see from these tribes is where the Philistines came from. The Philistines being a tribe of people who were one time major opponents of the Israelites, if you remember the giant Goliath. Now let's cover another son of Ham, who was Canaan. This is obviously where the land of Canaan came from, and they were driven out of their land by Joshua and the Israelites. The Canaanites are what we know today as the Africans. It is written in the Babylonian Talmud, For when the Africans came to plead against the Jews before Alexander of Macedon, they said, Canaan belongs to us, as it is written, the land of Canaan with the coast thereof. And Canaan was the ancestor of these people, i.e. ourselves. Basically, in 332 BC, when Alexander the Great conquered Palestine, the Africans came to Alexander claiming that the land of Canaan belonged to them. Verse 15 says, Canaan begot Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, the Jebusite, the Amorite, and the Girgashite, the Hivite, the Archite, and the Sinite, the Arvadite, the Zemorite, and the Hamathite. Afterward, the families of the Canaanites were dispersed. Sidon was the firstborn of Canaan, and where we get the Sidonians. 
In many history books, you'll read about the Sidonians under the name the Phoenicians. The Greeks called the Sidonians Phoenicians. These were the descendants of Ham. Before Greek conquest, they were the power structure of ancient civilization, and they spread out amongst the continent we know as Africa. The Hamite civilization included the continent of Africa, the land of Canaan, Israel, parts of Arabia, Syria, Phoenicia, Turkey, Babylonia, southern Persia, Iran, East Pakistan, and a large part of India. This is why it's spoken that in the ancient times, the black men were kings and queens. Because the Hamites, who were obviously darker skinned people, were the leaders of ancient civilization before Greek and Roman conquest. Now let's skip over Shem and go to the youngest son, Japheth, the people we know as the Japhites. This is probably the least discussed son of Noah. Genesis chapter 10, verse 2 through 5, goes over the children of Japheth. It says, The sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tiras. The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz, Ripath, and Togarmar. The sons of Javan were Elisha, Tarshish, Ketim, and Dunanim. Verse 5 says that from these, the coastal peoples of the Gentiles were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. So Japheth occupied the Isle of the Gentiles, which were the shore territories of the Mediterranean Sea in Europe and parts of Asia Minor, from where they dispersed northward over the entire continent of Europe and a great part of Asia. Japheth's descendants traveled west, north, and northeast of the mountain of Ararat and the Caucasus Mountains. Let's talk about the sons of Japheth. Again, they were Gomer, Magog, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tetras. Gomer was the ancestor of the first Cimmerians and of the later Cimbri. These people include offshoots of the Celtic family and of the present-day Gaels of Ireland, Scotland, and the Hebrides Islands. Then the second son of Japheth was Magog. The Greeks called these people Scythians. The Scythians included all the wandering tribes who dwelt mostly near the north of the Black and Caspian Seas. They later migrated to Central Asia, Russia, and the Ukraine. The third son of Japheth was Madai, the father of the Medes. They were located at the southern part of the Caspian Sea, and they later united with the Persians to form one race. The fourth son of Japheth was Javan. From him came the Ionians and all the Greeks. We also find Ashkenaz, the son of Gomer, Japheth's grandson, formed the Germanic race, better known as the Germans. This is the tribe where the Ashkenazi Jews of Europe descend from. This is a topic that should be understood deeper. In the 4th century, the Germanic tribes were on the move. They were known under these names, Lombards, Burgundians, Franks, Saxons, Angles, Jutes, Ostrogoths, Visigoths, Suavis, and Vandals. These ten Germanic barbarian tribes settled all over Western Europe and intermingled with modern nations of Western Europe as we know them today, which is where we get Europeans. The children of Japheth are where we get the Europeans from today. Now we know that the Europeans are what is classified as the white or Caucasian race today. So the question is, were they originally white beginning from Japheth? This question is difficult to say for sure. Anybody that feels that they can say this one way or another is speaking in absolutes that they should absolutely not use. All we can do is track people through the line of history, through their tribes. Lastly, we will discuss Shem, who we know as the Semites. Chapter 11 of the book of Genesis goes over the sons of Shem until we get to Abram, who later will be named Abraham. Abraham was not only the father of the Hebrew Israelite nation, but also of the Arab nation. Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Genesis chapter 16, verse 1 says, Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian and maidservant whose name was Hagar. Hagar bore Abraham's first son, Ishmael. The Bible doesn't speak of his descendants, 
but other historians note that he married an Egyptian woman and had 12 sons. These 12 sons became 12 tribes and inherited the region from the Euphrates to the Red Sea and the Arabian Peninsula. And from Abraham's other son, Isaac, we see his son Jacob, who bore the 12 tribes of Israel. The other son of Isaac was Esau. This is where we get the Edomites from. Edom meaning red. This was an ancient nation south of Israel and Moab. They were opponents of the Israelites. Now there's a lot of false teaching today that Esau is the white man, mainly because of his red skin and the judgment that Elohim has placed on Esau. But Esau is not the white race. This is an extreme false teaching and is easily proven to be false when simple research is done as is shown today. The descendants of Shem were also black as well, but this will be proven in the next part of this discussion. When discussing the Bible, this information should really assist with understanding who the Gentiles are. In the Bible, the Gentiles are also known as the other nations. When looking at the people in ancient history by their tribes, it should really drive that point home. Now, as we go through world history, it begins to understand the Greek and Roman empires and how they intermingled with the other nations. You will be able to understand more how the skin color of nations changed in regions. One thing people like to tell me in my videos is that they don't believe Jesus was black, but he probably was a Middle Eastern. What they mean by this is that his complexion was of lighter skin and had different features than of the typical black American male. The reason why this view is held is because of what we see today of the people in the Middle East. They are a fairer skinned people. And to really just keep it real, many people who say this have racist views, whether they want to acknowledge it or not. And they could never see themselves worshiping a black Jesus. So they like to just say that they know Jesus isn't white, but he's not black either. But I'll get back to my point. The people we see in the Middle East today are a lighter, more olive skin color. This is what is shown on television, news, and entertainment. They don't often show the darker complexions of the people in the Middle East. Like these people in Yemen. Distinguished by their dark skin, they are the untouchables of Yemen. They are known as the Akhdam, an Arabic name for servants. They prefer to be called the marginalized ones, a caste languishing at Yemen's lowest social order. The thing is that this is not what the Middle East always looked like. When the Greeks Hellenized the world with their Greek culture, there was a lot of intermingling between tribes. So Japhites and Hamites and Semites were often being mixed together. This is easily understood when analyzing the Egyptians. The Egyptian empire was a second world empire and it is not very hard to understand that the people there were darker skinned people. The thing about black skin is that our melanin literally allows us to absorb the sun which made our skins compatible with the climates in the Middle East and Northern Africa. Now, after Alexander the Great conquered Egypt and established his major city, Alexandria, in Egypt, it's very easy to see how the Greeks cohabitated with the Egyptians. This happened in many places all over the conquered world. There are not many pure bloodlines of people today. The only bloodlines that are really kept pure are the Satanic Illuminati bloodlines, which I will not discuss in this video. The point I'm making is that there is no need for racism because today most of us are mixed with many different tribes and nations of people. We obviously have dominant traits that have been passed down, but we are all mixed with a lot of different tribes today. So you should never just speak against one because you may be actually speaking against yourself. The point of this part in this video series is to give proper background into the history of the tribes of the world. The world was divided by tribes, not by race. There were tribes and nations that conquered the world. We spoke about where the idea of racism came from, and then we discussed the tribes that inhabited the world. Will this end racism? Obviously not. But understanding that racism is an idea created in modern history may help put it in better perspective for us. The Bible teaches us many things if we choose to study it. There is no reason to judge anyone by their race and skin color. This was an idea created by white supremacists. I know it's hard to remove the classifications created. We have many stereotypes associated with our racial classifications as well. So it's not something that's going away. But racism is a tool used for division and it will be used to create civil wars in different places in the world. 
For example, like what's going on in South Africa and what is brewing in the United States. If we understand more about history, perhaps it may remove much of the ignorance that surrounds this subject. Now there obviously will be hate on all sides and racism isn't going anywhere. But what should be known by all in the end is that we all come from Adam. We are all created by the same creator and he has given us all the same chance of redemption and salvation through belief in Yahshua the Messiah. Yahweh does not look at us by our race. So those that are saved through the redemption of the blood of Yahshua must make real efforts to change the way we view others that we do not contribute to the racist mentalities that exist. There are many that would not worship Yahshua if they knew he was of darker skin. They love the idea of the white Jesus that has been spread by the Roman Catholic Church, but that is not reality. And on the flip side, there are many that refuse to even believe in Yahshua because all they've seen are the white Jesus images and they don't want to believe in European religions. It's too much about race and not about the truth. And that's why I made this video. All of these are misunderstandings that come from lack of information and study while also being programmed through media and formal education. But there are just things that need to be understood to better understand the true world we live in away from all the clutter that they've put in our mind. After we now understand racism and how the world was really divided by tribes and nations, we need to understand more about the Israelites and who they really are today. We will cover this in the next part. I hope this part educated and informed you. So thanks again for watching. If this has blessed you, please like it and share it with others. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so. Don't forget to follow this ministry on Facebook and Instagram. Again, I would like to thank all those who support this ministry. I truly am humbled by your support. You are an answer to sincere prayers and I thank the Father for you. Thanks again for your support. I love you all.